and okay we are trying to understand what um, is sexism and how it affects us like now we understand that with the test for our time is um, for me i would say is how i treat my wife my children my neighbors especially with regards to having the correct understanding uh, about gender um so it's going to be a discussion i want it to be a discussion i'm going to pose some questions so feel, please feel free to deject or raise your hand or cut me off that's okay uh, but I'm going to try and uh, make it so that it's uh, a discussion back and forth. So I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. And this study is uh, taken from a study that uh, Elder Tess did two weeks ago. And uh, that study also didn't have a title because uh, she was kind of, it was like almost like a question and answer, which I thought it was nice because it kind of answered some of the questions that I had. and raised some more questions for me. So to start us off, my first question uh, uh, rhetorically is how different are we really uh, as men and women? How different are we and what does it fundamentally mean that we are different? So ideally people have a fascination of finding differences in men and women that do not exist. Like just, just uh, this fascination of we're different and uh, trying to like to pick things here and there to show how different we are. And, and, and unfortunately the world that we live in, that's the nature of um, how things are, we try to uh, separate uh, people. And by us separating people, then once we put them in this class or that class, then we kind of focus all our good energy on one side and the bad energy on that class. And that's what is not right. And that's what God does not want us to uh, carry into heaven. So, as a movement from the from this study, uh, we know. Uh, well, I'm going to set forth the what the what I understood the study to to say. Fundamentally, is that the terms brother, sister, mother, and father. These are terms of gender. And when we say gender, I was trying to have some uh, definitions. When we say gender, we are saying uh, socially constructed norms of uh, like how things are. And as a movement, what we are saying is that gender does exist. We're not trying to erase gender. So the term sister or mother can be used in different situations to divide people. That's what we're saying. We're saying the, the term sister, brother can be used to divide people. Say if I come to a group, the way we are a group here, and I say uh, all the brothers to the right, all the sisters to the left, uh, then um, like once I do those divisions, then now it's easier to direct whatever I want towards which group. So back then when gender was not a test, it was perfect because when we say brother and sister, we are reminded that we have a big family, that we are a big family. And gender was a good practice for the last 2000 years, but not right now. We are in a time period when God is trying to show us just how wrong we understand it, how warped our perception of gender really is. 
So point number one, and if anybody does not uh, agree or maybe they think different, please, you're welcome to interject. Point number one is that we are not trying to eradicate the existence of gender. What we are trying to do as a movement is to de-emphasize gender in our brain. So for, for most of us, when we think gender, we think of these differences that are, that are like here and here. But what we're trying to do is by de-emphasizing, by reducing the relative importance of gender in our brain, we're trying to bridge that gap to bring it down here. So I thought that was a cool way to kind of picture it in our mind. So what does it mean to de-emphasize gender? Um, so what it is is, okay, who can tell me? Maybe, yeah, let me start like that. What are some of the ways that we can do, we, we, we can actually um, employ to de-emphasize gender in our brains? Can, can you repeat that question again? Like, uh, so I say that uh, uh, as a movement, we are not trying to eradicate the existence of gender. What we are doing is de-emphasizing gender in our brain. So, so my question is, what are some of the ways that uh, we, or we, we are doing or the world is doing? Because it's not just us who are on this quest. There are like people all over the world who are seeking gender equality. They are, they are on this path to de-emphasize gender. That is to reduce that gap where we say, or like men are from Mars and women are from Venus. So there's this big difference. So we're saying, actually, no, we are not so different. And actually the differences don't matter. So the question is, um, what, uh, what, are, like, what are we, like what are some of the things that we're doing to de-emphasize gender in our brain? Not just ask me, like, like maybe something that we've seen in the world. Well, there's many things we can do. We can start uh, by destigmatize. Is that a word? But sure. Um, some roles, uh, some roles that in the society will pertain to men and some will pertain to women. And so those roles can be those roles can be performed either by men or women. That could be one way. And another way would be to educate men uh, to the to the fact that women are capable of, of doing things, and women to the fact that they are also capable of doing other things. You know that they have been. Uh, 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 I say that you know that the world you know put them in a the box. So, yeah, that would be two ways to start with, I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way, actually. Uh, there's a word there that I, I actually went to look into what the definition was, and that is stigma. Um, the, there's a definition here from the dictionary where it says in Christian tradition, it meant, uh, no, 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 that's not what we want to. The first one, a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or a person. So it's a mark of disgrace. There's another one that I liked. Okay, it's kind of uh, lost, but there's, a, uh, there's another definition here, social stigma, the disapproval of or discrimination against an individual or group based on perceivable social characteristics. 
that serve to distinguish them from members of a society. So there's this distinguishing that's going on with gender saying, these are men, these are women. And uh, once they've been classed like that, then um, there can be a disapproval or discrimination against that group. And we have to say that in, in particular to men and women, women have found themselves on this receiving end where they've been discriminated against for a long time. So, so what we are saying is that for us to de-emphasize gender in our brains, we need to understand that we have to undo the prejudices and stigma that has arisen out of people thinking that women are so very different. And they're different, like people can bring uh, uh, different um, um, uh, ideas with regards to the differences by saying men are physically strong or physically different than women. But now they bring that, uh, like the physical differences to psychological to say because men are strong then they can do this or because women are not as strong then they cannot do this they cannot do this so gender is not the characteristics that define us so gender we are not defined by gender so if you list all the things that defines you or if i list all the things that define me gender is not the predominant characteristics so this is a statement from the study i want to see what your thoughts are on this statement so gender should not define so gender is not the characteristics that define you how do you understand that statement Well, gender, gender itself isn't a characteristic, really, at all. Okay. You know, it's just a, it's a biological thing, and it's not a characteristic. You, you can't take the whole group of women and have a characteristic that necessarily applies to all of them equally and not to men. So women is a biological factor, but not really a characteristic. So uh, we brought two things. We've talked about gender. Well, can we say gender identity versus biological biological what? Biological sex. So brother Jonathan, what you're saying is that uh, gender in itself is not a characteristic. It's biological. Sorry, I missed your point. I thought you, didn't you originally say the sex of a person? Or are you saying ident uh, gender identity? So right now we're just dealing with gender identity. Okay. So I, I from this study from, the, like later on in the front. I know we might not get to the end of it because I'm kind of doing um, thoughts and reactions to this study of how I understood it. Mm -hmm. So in this study later on, it breaks down gender identity and separates it from biological sex. Right. So I'm hoping to get there. What but, was the original question though? Like you, you said about gen, I might've been gender was what you Yeah, so the, so the question I was asking is, uh, let me uh, explain it like this and then I'll uh, ask the question. Um, I have a background myself where I used to play soccer and I was trying to get pro and all that and all that. Yeah, God saved me. And uh, I had a guy when I was 23 years old and I had come to Canada, uh, a very good friend of mine, came to me and said, Douglas, I want to talk to you. And he told me, you know, you should be very careful. You should not let soccer define who you are. Like when someone thinks of Douglas, they think of Douglas, the soccer player. 
then I was like, hmm, he actually has a point. So in this particular instance, I've been, I've been uh, defined by what I'm capable of doing, not by who I am that enables me to do that which I'm, uh, that I'm excelling in doing. So with regards to gender, we're saying that just by me being a man, that is what defines me. And from the nature of man studies, when we are looking at the lower powers, we're talking about appetite, we're talking about um, um, uh, emotions. And they're saying these are the characteristics these are the that make me who I am. And these are the characteristics that I'm taking to heaven. So it does not matter if I'm a man or a woman. Although I was tempted to think that uh, me being a man or a woman uh, makes me go through life a certain way. Say like now the gender, gender roles is that um, a man would be, let me say it from the African perspective, when you turn 14 years old and you have to go through the rite of circumcision, they send you into the bush with other boys and you're supposed to go and hunt this big animal. And when you come back, that shows that you're a man. So you're kind of, gender is kind of defining who you are. But what you're saying is that that's not right. That's not true. Because the, if you do the same thing with girls and send them out there, they can do the same thing. So uh, your gender is not the predominant characteristic that defines who you are. Yes, it does have, a, uh, an, it, it, it does have a, um, a say, but it's not the predominant characteristic that defines you. Whether you're a man or a woman, it does not define you. And when we talk about you and me, we're talking about um, character, character development. So I just wanted to hear your what you thought about this statement because I kind of went over it trying to think about it myself as I was understanding this study. Uh, is it clear or someone has a question? All right, so I'll move on. And uh, this statement kind of leads us up to where we are right now, where we, we understand, uh, say, as of 2019, the term elder is no longer gendered. Instead, it's, uh, it stands or as it, uh, it's a representation of equality. Say we have Elder Tess, Elder Paminda, you know, before with the mindset that we had or I had before, I, I was so much against women ordination and I would have fought it tooth and nail to be like, no, that, that's not the order that God has set. But now we understand that women can be elders, women can be priests, right? Um, like what was once considered uh, exclusive, you know, like the term elder would be exclusively for men is no longer exclusive. So this study, there was a, a question that was asked that kind of portrayed these four statements here that I want us to look at and talk about. And uh, the, the person asking the question or the way it was phrased in this study was that uh, there's a physical difference between men and women that uh, female are weaker than men if you consider the physical difference. And uh, if we were to go about trying to change things up, say we ran into a problem and uh, they, it, was, it was termed as the toilet problem where men and women 
Uh, when men and women's toilet have to be separated to protect women. And if, if we were to change that, then there would be a lot of rapes that would increase. So the problem is where we, we, where we have to understand that we'll have a problem if we understand these differences uh, as, as physical and then we move them to mental or spiritual. And that's what, that's how the world has been operating for a long time, I think, that um, because a man is supposedly strong, then they are assigned like leadership role when it comes to spiritual matters. Um, you got a question. Yes, question, please. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I, sorry. Okay, I just had this question now. Um, when we're talking about being strong, are we talking about physically being strong, about uh, mentally being strong, about, um, you know, what kind of strength are we really talking about here? So we're talking about physical strength. So we are saying we're taking our physical strength and then we are moving it and applying it across mental and spiritual. And that way we are putting this difference, like this line of demarcation to say men are stronger physically and because men are stronger physically, they are stronger mentally and they're stronger physically and they're stronger spiritually. But I don't see that eye to eye because I don't see that men are stronger physically, uh, spiritually and mentally because you know the women, they can be sometimes stronger in various different uh, ideas, um, you know, ideology or whatever, you know, certain theories and understanding of things, even much better uh, perceptions sometimes than men might be, you know, so that, I mean, this is, if, if a person looks at it, you know, because a person is stronger physically that they are also stronger otherwise, then they have a misconception. Yeah, that's true. That's why we are reviewing this study as we try to understand the nature of sexism. Because what we're saying is that for the longest time, uh, this sexism has been running rampant and people have been building all these fascinating ideas to try to differentiate uh, men from women. And one of the uh, tools that they use is to say that men are physically strong. And because men are physically strong, they assume that men, men are mentally strong, they assume that men are spiritually strong than women. So they employ the term of naturally, or if you go to nature, men are much stronger than women. So, we are, so what I'm saying is that we have a, it would have a pro, like if that's how we're thinking, that we would have a problem. And I agree with what you're saying that sometimes women can be not, so much physically strong, but mentally they are so strong. Spiritually they are so strong. So I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I'm just in reviewing this study. I'm uh, I, I'm trying to take some time to understand the nature of sexism, how it's been built up to where we are and how we can be able to break it down. Even it's something that, yes. Got, no, I'm just thinking here. I mean, even when it comes to physical strength, um, I still even remember uh, when I was in school, there was one female. Um, she was really quite a tough person. I mean, you know, her strength was also really quite domineering to the point there that it, uh, it put, definite certain fear in various of the guys, you know, so, um, and I know that there are bodybuilders out there too, female bodybuilders, that, man, they make me look like nothing, <laughs> you know, right. so, so really, you know, um, again, it depends on the determination of the person, it depends on the position, it depends on the physical nature, it depends on various different things here, you know, so women can be definitely much stronger than men in, in various fields, including in the physical as well. Yes, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's true. That's the reality. Um, and I'm praying that we can get to understand that 
terms of differences, there's not much of differences and actually those differences, if we say gender identity, then they do not define who we are. We are um, so, so that argument that female is weaker than men, females are weaker than men is dangerous. Because that's the same argument that goes to say that the law has been, well, the, in, in this question that had been asked in this study, that the law was there to protect women because they are, they are, they are weaker than men. And um, the way it was uh, broken down was really nice, the way I understood it, that the law is there to protect the vulnerable but what, what makes people vulnerable is not physical weakness, it's social stigma, it's discrimination, it's conspiracy theories. The law is supposed to be there to protect um, blacks and Americans and Muslims and Jews, LGBTQ women, but none of all of that is be, is because of physical weakness so the reason is that all of that is because of a history of discrimination and bias that has caused untold damage so example when someone takes a gun this example was really nice when someone takes a gun and kills people he does not do it because of how strong or how weak they are. No, he does it because of stigma, because of discrimination. And imagine how much stigma, like someone, like how much misunderstanding someone would have to go and kill someone just because they look different than them. In, um, in Ontario, we had just recently um, this white gentleman who was driving a cab truck in one of the small towns. And uh, there was a family of four Muslim uh, family that was walking and he just rammed into them. So he didn't do it because they were weak. No, he did it because of stigma that was associated with people being Muslim. So these are sensitive topics. So if we, 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 we have to take time to, uh, to understand them. That's why back when uh, in 2018, when two streams of information was introduced, what we understood as a movement is that being in the wrong stream affected our perceptions of gender. Our midnight cry was about gender. So we needed to understand the danger of the wrong stream and all the wrong ideas we had about gender. And I thank God for the midnight cry because it opened our understanding and changed our mindset of like 180 degrees, I would say for me. But still we need to understand that as a movement, we have not arrived. This, the message has, is, and will continue to challenge us in all the areas where conspiratory thinking, Babylonian evangelical thinking, discriminatory thinking have impacted our brains. So that means that there is much that we need to learn. There is much that we need to unlearn. So for this Sabbath school study, as we wind down, fundamentally, no, foundationally, we are not saying that gender does not exist. And gender here we're saying is, um, you are born with a biological sex, a sexual identity, whether you're male or female, that is assigned to you at birth, according to your biology, 
when I was born, they looked at me, turned me around. They say, okay, this guy, this is a, this is a boy. Uh, this is a male. So we are not saying that biological sex does not exist. Biological sex is real and it exists. Even trans people, they recognize that biological sex exists. So now when we come to the issue of gender identity and biological sex, what we are saying is for me, being a boy, being born a, a, a male, and I started out life, whatever gender roles that were put on me, that as a boy, you are supposed to be like this, you're supposed to grow up like this, you're supposed to grow up like this, my biological sex and my gender identity, they come together, they are the same. And there's a large number of people, majority of people, who their gender identity and their biological sex comes together, they conform. Their gender identity conforms to their biological sex. But for a small minority of people, they are born in, in one shell, their biological sex, and as they grow, usually from a young age, they start to recognize that their gender identity is not in agreement with their biological sex. So how does society deal with this problem? Is this a problem that is recent in society or is it a problem that has been there for a long time? For a long time, society has termed this where the gender identity and uh, the biological sex do not come together. They've termed it as mental illness. And it's not a mental illness. For me, that's a big step to come to understand that it's not a mental illness. And it's not about hormones. All those things, they have been tried in previous generations to be dealt with in all manner of ways to try and deal with it, to try and sort it out, to try and say, okay, it's only male or female. But in this dispensation, God is opening it up to us to understand that there's male and there's female and in between here, there's... Um, people and it's a, a, it's it's lots of people who are not identifying or are having struggle identifying with either male or female or the gender uh, identity that has been assigned to them and how we treat them is the question that god wants to us to get right in this dispensation. Um, in history, I, I, I was surprised to find out something called gay conversion therapy. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Gay conversion therapy, does anybody know? I can honestly say I don't. Okay. Yeah, I went um, to the, yeah someone else, maybe someone has... Uh, I don't know if I have it right, but I believe the Christians were coming up with a way to rehabilitate people who had uh, same-sex attraction. So they would like take them to a camp or something like that <laughs> and uh, pretty much try to uh, save them yeah. by turning them back into homosexuals. No, turning them back to heterosexual. Heterosexual, thank you, Douglas. Yeah, so it supposedly helps gay people overcome same-sex attraction. I understand uh, it was quite controversial because it was somewhat abusive. I don't know, like, tell us, Douglas, I'm curious. Yeah. 
just was saying that uh, this therapy is ineffective, is unethical, often harmful, exacerbating anxiety and self-hatred among those treated for what is not a mental disorder. So the way they are, they are describing it is a, a therapy that claims to convert gay people into heterosexuals. And that it actually went to court and uh, um, so they were, like you went to court because some people were seeking to sue those counselors who are offering this therapy and others were seeking to defend them. So, we need to understand that this problem is part of the midnight cry message and understanding these people, I don't like saying that because it kind of puts them in a the wrong way. Understanding these people and how we relate to them and how we as a society, we should treat them. That is our test. So that is our Saba school presentation today. I was, I was trying to finish it within uh, time. So we have four minutes. If anybody wants to add something or uh, a question so that we can understand it more. I just wanted to add a comment on the conversion therapy that the whole thing started with the premise. I think Maka said, and it's, sometimes we don't catch ourselves in, in, in our language, but she said, turn them back into heterosexuals. That's assuming that they were hetero, heterosexuals to begin with and became gay and we have to turn them back. But that's the premise that they operate with because they believe everyone is born heterosexual and that somewhere along the way they went wrong and we got to bring them back. Right. So it's it's a wrong premise but it, because they're born that way. And if they're born that way, that means that I was born heterosexual. And if you think that you can convert someone back, that means that you believe you can be converted into a homosexual, right? Yeah. Like the opposite has to be true, right? According to parable methodology. So, and we know that's not true. You can't be converted. It's, a, it's just the way that you're born. It's, it's all a part of your identity. Yeah. You are. Thank you for that. I also had something that I missed uh, when you're talking about the emphasizing gender, gender in our brain. I found an article in the New York Times that was talking about something that's going on in Sweden where um, the, the teachers, uh, in them de-emphasizing, reducing the relative importance of gender in our brain, they are avoiding pronouns like him and her. They're getting children to, like girls are not urged to play with toy kitchens and wooden or Lego blocks, are not considered toys for boys. Um, so they kind of say everyone gets to play with dolls and uh, if a boy cries, then the teachers try and give him as much affection just the way they would the, like with a girl. So that's one of the way, and they actually, they have been commended for, for doing that because uh, the society is trying to have this, this egalitarian mindset uh, for um, uh, gender equity. So I don't know about that. Um, that's now where I, I like, for me, I get confused because I'm thinking like this study helped me to understand that we do not say gender does not exist. It does exist, but we, we should not give it such a big place in our mind so that we use it to define people and to put people in captivity. In this particular instance, uh, I don't think I 
fully agree with what you're saying, taking away he or him, because biological sex is real and it exists and you cannot deny it. What you're trying to do is to bring those two together and when it, where it does not come together, right? We, we have this, um, like we have the responsibility to understand it more, not to force things, to have things our way because the way we define things in our brain is either you're male or female, or you have to feel this gender identity or feel that gender identity because what I'm learning is that gender identity is personal. How, because like how someone feels. Right? Douglas. So, so yes. I have a question. Question, nothing. Hello, this is Claudio. Hey, Claudio. Uh, so if uh, I understand well, um, some people, they were born and they cannot go back, you know, like uh, Jonathan was saying. Yeah. So they, they are attracted um, with the same sex, uh, attraction and they have to be s maintaining celibacy for all their life because of their feelings inside of the or they can marry or I, I don't understand exactly how that will work in an equality uh, view point of view. Can you explain me something more about that? So, Claudio, the question you're asking is that um, if someone is born and they're gay, they're, they're, they're born and uh, they're gay, so they cannot go back. Should they go and uh, when they're grown up, can they marry and have uh, families? Yeah, is that your question? Yes, that's the question. Thank you. Yes, what does the Sabbath school class think? What does the class think about it? I would I would be curious to know why we think that wouldn't be okay. Like we we have to go back and review all the reasons why we we thought that was wrong to begin with. And I think that when you go back to the source that's where you end up finding the problem. And oftentimes it's going back into the very few Bible texts because it, it, it tends to be a Christian perspective. Um, you end up going into Bible texts where there's very few of them to begin with in the Bible that actually even talk about it. And the ones that do are actually quite obscure. And when you understand them within their context, they probably weren't saying what we thought they were saying. So if you start off with a broken foundation, everything else just was built on top of that. And so, you know, if, if we didn't understand uh, the nature of diversity in gender and um, things like that throughout all the history of this world, we didn't understand that stuff back then, but we understand it today. We're now responsible to deal with that. Um, so I, and I don't even know, I, from what I understand, the, the passages as we understand them on homosexuality, the way that we understand them today is a relatively new perspective on those verses. It wasn't around even a few hundred years ago. They had different understanding. So I think that we have to, rather than question how something would work, we have to question why do we think it wouldn't work in the first place? Where did those ideas come from? Okay, thank you. And, thank you. and I would add to what Jonathan is saying. Uh, first, it's, it's, it's really important that we take all of these uh, verses in context uh, because some of them do talk about homosexuality, some talk about health and some talks about us. So for example, Sodom and Gomorrah has nothing to do with um, homosexuality per se, but more about the abuse and more about the state of Adventism. 
that would be the first things to look at. And the second thing is to understand our dispensation and the fact that the message in itself, it's also a message of relationship. We understand that the relationships, you know, have been broken and that but everybody is entitled to have a relationship. We are not meant to be alone. So in taking that, those things into consideration, um, I think I don't see why um, a, a, a gay person would not have that right um, to, to find love. But to have a proper answer, I will, uh, I will say like Jonathan, you know, we have to, uh, to, to go back to those verses and uh, break them down. Thank you, thank you, Master. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I I would think that that would be a good study for you know to do to go back in and take all those verses and uh, and go deeper and and understand a little better. I don't know. That's my proposal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, as you're right, you would have to go back and take that study, those studies and uh, those verses and break them down. But just to close up, uh, the what we learned last time I presented was that the underlying test of the Omega history for our time, we say that it's not racism or Black Lives Matter. The test of the Sunday law will not be about racism. The issue in our dispensation or the issue at the center, the, the, the issue in our, uh, in our dispensation is, um, is the scene of Adam and Eve. So we started at Eden and we're going back to Eden. And we're saying uh, at the scene of Adam and Eve had to do with gender. That's where it started. when sin came in and Adam took over and patriarchy came on uh, 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 like, like started uh, domineering, then a woman was put at the bottom. And you're saying that issue of sexism started in, in Eden. And we say at the end of time, before we go to heaven, God wants us to understand what sexism is. And we, we say that sexism encompasses not just the likes of women, it encompasses all the questions related to LGBTQ. So the question of whether a gay person should marry or not, that is a question that is encompassed by sexism. And when we say sexism, we are saying um, any form of discrimination or putting down of the women and uh, any anything that is not male because it's male and female and male is has been on top for a long time and women has been like they've been trampled on. So we are saying God wants to bring this balance and as God is bringing this balance, he's opening to us so many things that we were not ready to uh, to understand a few years ago, but God wants us to understand now before we go to heaven. So thank you so much. I know I've taken uh, eight minutes, I was trying to finish on time, but thank you for indulging me with the discussions. And I'm praying that God may continue to bless us, to show us um, uh, the way that we should walk in, even at this particular time, God is doing it. So thank you again. And uh, I'd like to close with a prayer before we transition to the main study. Okay, let's pray. Our kind and loving Father who art in heaven, we are grateful for this moment that you've given us to share, to talk about your love, talk about your kindness, talk about your word, talk about the how you've brought us so far to where we are, to understand that uh, we need to be a group of people who uh, about giving freedom to mankind just the same way as you are a God who gives freedom and you do not put people in captivity. So even as we learn about gender and all this sexism, which is the issue of the Sunday law in our times, Lord, 
we do not even know, we've not even scratched the surface. We cannot say that we understand. We're just trying to spend more time with you as your teachers. I pray that you may open our minds so that we can uh, be able to understand and do away with all these things that we've been, that are, that are in our minds with regards to how things should be uh, because we think we know, but we do not know. So let us look forward to you so that you may give us knowledge, you may give us understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.